This case is not a game. It is my client's life. We don't play fast and loose with the facts. Tonight on the Donlin Report, the fate of Kyle Rittenhouse will be in the hands of the jury soon. What would you do if you were in the jury box? It's now a waiting game. We'll break down the main issues for both sides. Plus, something to be thankful for 10 days before Thanksgiving. Danny Fenster, an American journalist held in jail in Myanmar for months, is coming home. And did you see this? The store has been repeatedly burglarized. We get shoplifted. When we contact 911, they refuse to send police officers to the scene because no one was harmed. So imagine you own a business and it's being ransacked. You call police and they say they can't come due to staff shortages. We'll talk with that business owner coming up in this hour. Great to have you with us as we start a new week. Live from our Chicago studios, the Donlin Report starts right now. Good evening. The nation awaits the verdict in the murder trial of Kyle Rittenhouse. That is the pulse of America tonight. Closing arguments will be over soon, and it will be in the hands of the jury. Rittenhouse's fate, that is, and we will wait for that likely tomorrow. And if you're like us, you've been talking about this case a lot. And now, 12 people in Kenosha will decide. 12 Americans serving on a jury will decide the fate of a 17-year-old at the time who shot three people, killing two of them claiming self-defense. Certainly a tall order for 12 everyday people like you and me. Would you be able to be impartial if you were on that jury? Would you be able to consider only the facts of the case and turn off all the noise? Because the noise has been deafening. The far right views Rittenhouse as a hero. The far left views him as a villain. The truth, like most of the rest of America, probably lies somewhere in between. But this trial has become political, no doubt, as most things tend to do. Here are some of the facts. Many experts believe the prosecution botched the case. We shall see. Also, whether you think he's a hero or a villain or something in between, Rittenhouse's testimony changed a lot of minds. Again, we shall see. Only 12 will decide that in the end. But a lot of people saw that testimony as affirmation of their support for Rittenhouse as a hero or, on the other hand, as a guilty vigilante. Rarely does a legal case grip the country like this one has. And with the country on the edge of its seat, waiting on word now from those 12 in Kenosha, the governor of Wisconsin has called 500 National Guard troops to be on hand for potential unrest after this verdict is ultimately announced. And that's where we start tonight with two attorneys, Brian Claypool and Randy Zellin, both to have great, uh, great to have both of you back with us tonight. Randy, let's start with you. Give us just your sort of 30 second headline of what you took away from the closings today. The headline will be that Mr. Rittenhouse, in my humble opinion, will be acquitted. Whether you want to say that the prosecution botched it or actually did justice by presenting witnesses who established that, in fact, Mr. Rittenhouse had a reasonable fear that harm was going to come to him. When you have one witness testify that one victim grabbed at, went to grab at his gun, when you have other testimony from another victim who had a gun, when you couple that with the fact that Mr. Rittenhouse took the stand, broke down, as you would expect a kid to break down whose life is on the line, there is no way that a jury will find anything other than the fact that there is reasonable <coughs> doubt, to say the least, mm. that Mr. Rittenhouse intended to commit any offense conduct. Brian, your headline. Yeah, two headlines. First, the videotape used by the prosecutor actually helped the defense to the extent that it showed that uh, that Rittenhouse was not the aggressor, that these three victims were the aggressor. In all three instances, as Randy has indicated, uh, Rittenhouse was uh, attacked, hit with a skateboard. One of the victims grabbed his gun. Uh, Rosenbaum lunged, and he had soot actually on his hand, which mean that he, means that he had his hand on the barrel of the gun. And that means that under the law in Wisconsin, that I think a jury is going to find that it's reasonable uh, for Rittenhouse to believe that uh, you know he was in fear of serious, serious bodily harm. The other real quick headline, Joe, I thought defense counsel did an exceptional job of demonizing the victims. Nobody has really talked about Rosenbaum, Huber, 
and 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 uh, gross crowds at all, really, until now. And then you you see the videotape of what they were doing behind the scenes, and whether we like it or not, Joe, jurors look at whether they like somebody, whether they're a likable person. And I came away from these closing arguments thinking, wow, these guys really were kind of like part of a mob, well, the and that might make thing. it easier now. Yeah. For, yeah, it might make it easier now for the jury to acquit Rittenhouse. Yeah. The, the whole thing, as you're looking at this video, as you can see, it, it was off the rails. Uh, for folks who didn't get to hear any or much of the closings, let's play just a little clip from, uh, I believe we'll start with the prosecution. You know, this is not like a normal murder case. A lot of murder cases were in here trying to convince a jury that the defendant killed somebody. That's not in dispute here. That's the easy part. The question is, does he get a pass? The court has also instructed you on provocation. You cannot hide behind self-defense if you provoked the incident. If you created the danger, you forfeit the right to self-defense. Randy, let's pick up with that because this goes to what you were saying a minute ago, but you, can you claim self-defense when you've essentially created the situation? This was the prosecution's argument, saying no reasonable person would have behaved that way. Well, here's the problem. That's not the way the prosecution presented the case, because it just so happens that under Wisconsin law, as I understand it, if I provoke the incident, then I cannot use justification as a defense. But if you go back, the prosecution never led with that theory. They made it a straight, listen, he was out looking to hurt someone. How do you Had determine gone who in provoked from the what, Randy? How do you determine who provoked what? Everybody was provoking everyone. Well, because if you, if your theory, and every case has a theme, if your theme is from the get-go that Kyle Rittenhouse was someone in search of a problem, if he went there to bring a gun to an argument over property, but that's not the way the prosecution presented it. They went too far. They gilded the lily, and now they want to come back with provocation. Remember, self-defense, it's not an affirmative defense. Mr. Rittenhouse doesn't have to prove that he was justified. The prosecution has to disprove <clears throat> beyond a reasonable doubt, meaning I don't need any more information, and they need a hell of a lot more information to convict this kid. He's not getting convicted. All right, Brian, let's listen to the defense quickly here. This case is not a game. It is my client's life. We don't play fast and loose with the facts, pretending that Mr. Rosenbaum was citizen A number one guy. He was a bad man. He was there. He was causing trouble. He was a rioter. And my client had to deal with him that night alone. So, Brian, the, the writer, D David French, said you can be in the wrong place for the wrong reasons and make a series of stupid decisions, but can still have the right to defend your life with deadly force. I don't envy this jury. What does it come down to? Yeah, well, I, well, I think defense did a good job of humanizing Rittenhouse, and he also humanized the victims. And getting back to that provocation issue, Joe, this isn't the typical provocation you see in criminal cases. In other cases, somebody goes up and they'll... They punch somebody. They actually start a fight or they stick a gun in somebody's face. Say, I'm going to kill you, right? That's provocation. What, what, what did Rittenhouse do to provoke Rosenbaum? He did something lawful. He's not even charged with the, the gun firearm they charge anymore. That, yeah. So he lawfully, he, right, he's lawfully there pointing a gun. He didn't do anything to provoke. And a point I made earlier today was this, like focusing on Rosenbaum. The argument was made, oh, well, he didn't have a gun. You know, Rosenbaum is unarmed. That doesn't matter under the law. If Rosenbaum is charging after uh, Rittenhouse, and, he, and Rittenhouse has already heard that, go get him, go kill him, and he's within a foot of, of Rittenhouse, I mean, a police officer, Joe, would be justified in shooting as well. At that point in time, you can deploy deadly force. Right. And then on the other two, you've got a, a, a skateboard hitting him in the head. That's a deadly weapon. So... I'm with Randy on this one. I mean, I, I really don't think it should be that hard for the jurors. Randy, uh, I'm out of time, but quickly, if you can, in 10 seconds or more, the lesser charges that are now included, do you think those come into play? And do you think this could be a hung jury? No, it will be an acquittal. All right, there you go. That's less than 10 seconds. My producer thanks you, and so do I. Brian Claypool, <laughs> Randy Zellin, thanks for the time. Take care.
Had, Joining me now on the cultural fallout this case has created, host of Eat, Drink, Smoke. He joins us every now and then. Good to see him tonight, Tony Katz. Uh, Tony, let's start with something a frequent guest on our broadcast here, Matt Taibbi, wrote. Rittenhouse, he said, has become a symbol of so many things to so many people that the specifics of his legal case have ceased to be relevant. Do you agree with that? Uh, he's completely wrong on this. The legal aspects of the case matter quite a bit to the people who want to hate him. They want to ignore the fact so they can get into a cultural conversation about, oh, look at how horrible guns are. Or they can then somehow magically connect this case to a conversation uh, about race. Uh, culturally, this is a conversation about whether or not we're a nation of laws or we're a nation of emotions. That people have emotion about this case, I'm not saying no. And you talk about Governor Evers there of Wisconsin having 500 National Guard troops on the ready in case of riot. For what reason is there going to be rioting when you have a judge, when you have a jury, when you have presented evidence, when you have shown video evidence, and you get to a verdict that we don't know yet? what that verdict is. I believe that whole conversation is another cultural conversation about how there are some people who want to pressure a result and will do so with violence. And that has been completely ignored by cultural people or who mm. people who claim to play in the culture like Matt Taibbi. Do people you think want him convicted or acquitted based on what they think he represents versus what he did? Uh, I would argue that's absolutely true. And I think that you could say that in a lot of cases in, 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 a, in a lot of ways, but that isn't who we are. This, is, this has been a really big conversation about what it means to be a nation of laws versus what it means to have emotions. Your emotions do not factor in to the law. This idea that the prosecution has been trying to put forth First, they said, they actually said this today, uh, that if you bring a firearm, you lose your right to self-defense. Well, tell that to all the concealed carry holders across the United States who carry a firearm in case things go bad. They're not starting the conversation. They're making sure they can go home safely to their families. When you start playing down that road, as this prosecution did, showing a photo from the movie Roadhouse with Patrick Swayze and saying, oh, you've all been in a bar fight, Jerry. This is this is a bit of madness. This, yeah, this going was absolute on and has madness, to do with the Tony. Law. I mean, when you looked at the video that was played today in court, and I saw a lot of it for the first time, and I had seen a lot of it, this thing was out of control. I mean, people debate whether it was a protest. It was a full-on riot. I mean, it looked like yes. war on the street with people running around with ARs. It almost looked like a real-life video game, which begs the question: What in the world would you be even doing in that situation? So that's, I think, a fine question. And it's a question that you can ask. You can bring up to friends on the bar stool and you can talk to the newsroom about it and, and all sorts of things on social media. The question is, is it illegal? And no, it wasn't illegal for Kyle Rittenhouse to be there. We can discuss the illegal activity of people trying to tear down fences and attack that, that, that actual courthouse, trying to set that courthouse on fire, going around attacking other people, having the riots to begin with. That is all against sure. the law. If you're going in the middle of that, though, don't, shouldn't watching. you? That thing was just a match away from blowing up. You knew it was going to head off the rails any minute. You and I may not go. It doesn't make it illegal to go. We're sure. having a conversation about, would you go down there? We drink a beer. We're like, I wouldn't go down there if your life depended on it. Right. That's not how Kyle Rittenhouse and other people saw it. Now let's talk about what happened to Kyle Rittenhouse. While he was there, he was attacked three different times, twice by people physically assaulting him and once by someone who pointed their gun at mm. him, who admitted on the stand they were never going to point their gun or, or Kyle yeah. Rittenhouse didn't fire when his hands were up, but when he pointed his gun at Kyle Rittenhouse, that's when Gage Grosskreutz was shot at, which seems to a lot of people completely rational. Well, I'll tell you, as I said a minute ago, Tony, I, I don't envy this jury and I've been on juries. It, it's, it's tough work to begin with. I don't know how they start to sort this out, but we'll see. That process begins tomorrow. Tony Katz, good to have you again. Thanks. Absolutely. American journalist Danny Fenster held in jail in Myanmar for months, sentenced to 11 years on Friday. He's now coming home. Why did it take former Ambassador Bill Richardson a weekend to do what the State Department has been trying to do for months? I'll ask our resident State Department expert, Christian White, joins us ahead. Finally getting this done. So my message to the American people is this. America's moving again, and your life is going to change for the better. The White House gets an infrastructure win, but is it too little too late in the eyes of Americans? How new polling shows 
Republicans have an historic lead now ahead of next year's midterms. We'll get into that. Don't forget, you can follow us on social media at The Donlin Report on Twitter. Back after this. Story now we've been following today at News Nation. Six teenagers shot at Nome Park. This is in Aurora, Colorado. This shooting happened near Aurora Central High School, which went into lockdown earlier today. The ages of the victims range from 14 to 18. They were all transported to the hospital. The suspect has not been identified and is still at large. Another sad and difficult day for sure for the citizens of Aurora, Colorado. Now this. It was just shocking. It's, there are no words as a mother. Obviously, you want your, your child, no matter what age, they're your children forever, and you just want them home safe and sound. That was the mother of American journalist Danny Fenster. On our broadcast back in June, Fenster was sentenced to 11 years in prison in the Southeast Asian nation of Myanmar, but has now been released. His family will indeed have him back safe and sound. They wanted to wait before joining us again until that is indeed the fact. Meantime, the country's military government, which seized power in a coup in February, released Fenster after talks with emissary Bill Richardson, a former diplomat. Fenster's crime, publishing information that could harm the military government. And for that, he faced the possibility of 40 more years behind bars as prosecutors sought yet more charges. Human Rights Watch called the allegations trumped up and bogus. Either way, the news tonight is good. It sounds like he's been released. Former State Department advisor Christian Whiten joins us now. Christian, it's good to see you again. So the first question, I guess, is what is an ex-diplomat able to do that the State Department can't? Well, Richardson has done this before, as have other Americans of stature. You may recall, actually, Jesse Jackson got some U.S. Sure. soldiers uh, out of conflict in the Balkans. Basically, what you have is it's a, it's a little bit difficult for a country that's is somewhat estranged from the United States and other Western countries to be seen making concessions to us directly. So uh, if an independent party, even if it is someone who served previously in a U.S. cabinet under a Democratic president, uh, it's a little bit easier to deal with that person, save face, and still um, take an action that will actually slightly improve relations with the U.S. So how did this go so quickly, Christian, from convicted on Friday and then free on Monday? Is that coincidence or do you think that was intentional? Mm -hmm. No, I think it's very intentional. It's been going on. Basically, he's, you know, not guilty of a specific crime. He's guilty of journalism. Uh, the, the military junta messed up the, the facts of the case, such as they were accusing him of reporting for a news outlet he didn't actually work for anymore. Uh, what you have is Richardson, who works out of a foundation that's backed by the Qatari government, actually probably pressuring over the course of months to have him get out. And once the government had made that decision to let him go, they needed a conviction a pardon and then an airplane in this case which took him out to Doha. Amazing in just uh, the course of three days. How does this work though Christian overall? How is Richardson able to do this? I mean you say that the government can say the U.S. government can say look we didn't have anything he's working on his own but does he go in there essentially with a wink and a nod and the blessing of the U.S. government do the families pay him and in the end I guess is he sort of on his own to negotiate? Uh, that's about right. He said, I mean, it's it's not uh, extremely transparent, but he said he is supported financially by the Qatari government, by the foundation in Doha that he works for. But yes, this is someone who has been at the sort of top level of governments, the Energy Department, I believe, and right. the, and the uh, U.S. mission to the U.N. And um, so someone who would have worked with the U.S. government, clearly the U.S. government, the State Department was not at all surprised by this. And, you know, there is an impetus here to actually have some uh, re improved relations with Myanmar. They've been under military rule for most of their post-colonial history. Um, we're upset with that. We don't like that. But we also don't necessarily want to push them closer to China. So having some sort of uh, detente or toning down of, of some of the acrimony that they've uh, received and deserved recently right. is, is a U.S. goal. So it's probably in, in Myanmar's best interest as well, you're suggesting, which leads me to, you know, what is it that they want? Uh, typically, what does it take, Christian, to secure a release? They, they must have been using Danny for something. Right. Uh, for leverage or just sort of coincidental that, um, you know, they've had a, a breakout fall down in relation since their military coup because they had a bit of a democracy 
I wouldn't say renaissance, but a period. Aung San Suu Kyi wasn't the president, but a, 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 someone who had been a dissident was allowed to be the state counselor. And two elections in which the opposition won well. You know, the junta had given up some power, but essentially it took it back. Uh, now, they're okay having bad relations with a lot of people. This is not a government that's really interested in being received in the salons of Europe and the United States, but mm -hmm. it doesn't hurt to at least sort of staunch the bleeding, the, the decrease in relations with the West, with the United States. States to give some signal that they want to be back in and probably restart the game of, of creating some trappings of democracy, a little bit of space for the opposition for Aung San Suu Kyi, who uh, remains under arrest. I'm guessing in your experience at State, Christian, you've, you've seen some of these things resolve themselves. And I don't know if there's sort of a number, uh, how this comes to an end. Something had to happen with this exchange. Typically, how much does it cost? What does it take? Usually when you're dealing with a government, it actually doesn't come down to a payoff or money. That tends to be um, either criminal groups in, for example, South America or Central okay. Asia, terrorist groups. The you know, U.S. government doesn't encourage people to pay ransom right. to those groups, but it doesn't prosecute them, even though they are giving material support potentially to terrorists. But I, I doubt, though, I mean, the Burmese government is certainly a poor government, but I don't think payola really changed hands here. I could be wrong entirely. Uh, who knows if the Qatari government offered them something, Qatar has been a benefactor of a number of kind of creepy governments around the world. Um, but I think this is more of a diplomatic move. Well, it's a dangerous world for journalists out there, and we are certainly happy to That's report sure. tonight that Danny Fenster is on mm -hmm. his way back to Detroit. Christian White and former State Department advisor, good to see you again. Thanks. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. After President Biden's infrastructure win today, now on to his next challenge, confronting China. As the president prepares for a digital face-to-face -face with his Chinese counterpart, will the two global leaders be able to find any common ground? As we mentioned earlier in the broadcast, big day in the trial for Kyle Rittenhouse, closing arguments from both sides. Now we wait for the verdict. And in preparation, Wisconsin has deployed 500 National Guard troops to be on standby. Joining me now for the latest on the ground in Kenosha, Wisconsin, News Nation's Kelly Beeson. What's the latest there, Kelly? Well, good evening, Joe. The courtroom today was at full capacity. We were inside earlier today and then outside the courthouse. There have been about 25 to 30 people peacefully protesting. As you mentioned, the governor here in Wisconsin has allowed 500 National Guard troops to report to Kenosha ahead of a verdict in this case. And he also released a statement that reads in part, I urge folks who are otherwise not from this area to please respect the community by reconsidering any plans to travel there and encourage those who may choose to assemble and exercise their First Amendment rights to do so safely and peacefully. Joe. All right, Kelly Beeson live for us in Kenosha. Thanks for the update tonight. Now this. Thank you. We hear you and we see you. The bill I'm about to sign a law as proof that despite the cynics, Democrats and Republicans can come together and deliver results. President Biden taking a victory lap today as he signs his trillion dollar bipartisan infrastructure bill into law. One thing that's threatening to challenge the president's legacy, though, rising prices. It's an inflationary spike we have not seen in decades. Sticker shock hitting families hard this fall as consumer prices jumped more than 6% last month, with prices only expected to soar as we head into the winter months. This weekend, President Biden's top economic advisor signaled the White House is finally putting soaring inflation into the focus of the president's agenda, although he was vague when asked about an immediate action plan. Do you believe that just at the end of the day, everything you've done is everything that can be done with inflation? Or are there more tools in the toolbox that you might use if you think it's getting worse? We can address this issue in the short term and the medium term. In the short term, we're focused on uh, executing a strategy to finish the task on COVID. Those are immediate steps that we know actually will help return our economy to a sense of normalcy, affecting supply chains, working with ports. Here to talk more about this, former chairman of the President's Council of Economic Advisors and author of the new book, The Drift, Stopping America's Slide to Socialism. Kevin Hassett joins us now. Good to have you with us, Kevin. Thanks for the time. So Great to be uh, here. no specifics, but the administration has said COVID and the supply chain are key. If you were still in the chair, what would you recommend? 
Right. Well, what's been going on this whole year, you know, this Biden inflation has started because they've been throwing cash at the economy, uh, feeding demand. At the same time, they've been attacking supply, proposing huge tax hikes, uh, shutting down pipelines, uh, regulating firms within an inch of their lives. And so That's proposing, uh, you know, though, they call Kevin, those haven't, been, those haven't been implemented. Those are just proposed, right? You're talking about the, the, no, the next plan? No, no. But, but imagine... No, but imagine this, that, that so you have to build a new factory because there's so much demand for your product, but they're promising to raise the corporate tax starting the first of next year, like it's being legislated right now, and the you know factory won't make sense if the tax rate goes up. And so what's happened is that the expanded capacity that we need as the economy's been ramping back up hasn't come online because everybody's waiting to see if these huge tax hikes are coming. But also, like it is the case that, that they've you know stopped exploration for oil, uh, oil production in the U.S. is down about 2 million barrels a day. You know, they, they are uh, attacking so, supply while they're feeding demand. So what would you do then, Kevin? Inflation. What would be part of your plan? Yeah, well, so if it were me and I were in the White House, what I would be doing is I would be looking for ways to get more supply online. I, I would... Uh, you know, absolutely take off the table the big corporate tax hikes. Uh, and at the same time, I would, you know, allow uh, exploration and so on. Like the war, for example, against energy, energy prices are so high. Uh, it, it basically makes it so that people don't want to explore next year and the year after. And when that happens, the prices go up right away today. And so what I would do is once again, be friendly to energy. And if you did that, then energy prices would go back down, uh, supply would come online. And then finally, I wouldn't pass this uh, huge bill that they're talking about, which is going to throw even more cash at the economy. You think, yeah, because there are some, uh, there's differences on that. Some think it'll actually help, other think it's uh, throwing gasoline on it. Let's get you on the media if we can, Kevin, mm -hmm. while we have you. Taking heat for some tweets suggesting that things either aren't as bad as uh, we think or we can afford it. Here's part of it. And the dirty little secret here, Willie, while nobody likes to pay more, on average, we have the money to do so. Household savings hit a record high over the pandemic. We didn't really have anywhere to go out and spend. And as we said a moment ago, we're expecting retail sales this holiday season to break records. For those who own their homes, the value of our homes are up. And while the stock market isn't the economy, you got over half of American households with some investment in the markets, and the markets have hit record highs. So we need to put all of this in perspective. CNN's Brian Stelter posted a picture of a fully stocked store and uh, Twitter responded quickly pointing out that milk in particular isn't stuck on container ships. Uh, Kevin, are we out uh -huh. of touch on some of this stuff? I mean, people where they live, I know it's different in different parts of the country. They know what they're feeling and whether it's real. How long do you think this lasts? Right. Well, it's definitely real and it's definitely going to last a long time. And the way to think about it is that prices go up right away, but your salary, your wage adjusts pretty rarely, like usually like once a year. I don't know when yours changes, but usually around January, a lot of firms change salaries. And so the, the wages fall behind the prices. And so you go to the gas pump, you tank up, and then you go to the grocery store, you don't have much money left. But then in January, you tell your boss you need a raise. But then when you get that raise, then he's got to raise his prices again, and you get into a wage price spiral. And so right now, it looks to me very, very much like uh, Joe Biden's playing the Jimmy Carter playbook. And that doesn't end well. It ends with double digit inflation and eventually a real harsh crackdown by the Fed. And that's frankly, I think, the policy path that we're on, sadly. All right. Uh, the book is called The Drift, Stopping America's Slide to Socialism. Kevin Hassett, it's good to have you with, you, with us. Thank you. Great to be here. Thank you. Even though Mr. Biden's celebrating a victory today, his poll numbers are tanking, plunging to a fresh low. According to a new Washington Post ABC News poll, 41% of Americans approve of the commander in chief's performance. That's down a whopping 11 points since the spring. That same poll says if voters headed to the polls today, 51% of registered voters said they would back Republican candidates. I want to bring in now our regular political reporter for The Hill, our partners, Julia Manchester. Julia, the, the infrastructure passage doesn't seem to have moved the needle here on the polls anyway. Does this go back to what we were just talking with, with Kevin? Do you think at what you know, James Carville said, is the economy stupid? How critical will this be moving forward, turning it around? 
Absolutely. I think it's easy to say that this is the economy being reflected in Joe Biden's approval ratings, as well as on that generic congressional ballot. You've seen as inflation has rised, American discontent with the economy is growing, especially as we head into the holiday season when we see more Americans really heading uh, to stores and online to spend more and may not have as much money in their pockets or won't, won't be able to afford what's available to buy. However, talking to Democrats, they say, look, we need to sell this infrastructure bill. We need to have local events in various congressional districts. We need to get state parties involved, senators, uh, lawmakers involved, really to sell this to the American people. That's why you're seeing Joe Biden head to New Hampshire tomorrow to sell this, and Kamala Harris heading to Columbus, Ohio on Friday to sell this. So Democrats say, look, Hold on one second. Once we get this infrastructure bill uh, passed through, which it is, and you know, really enacted, we could see some dividends paid to Joe Biden in poll numbers. Well, we will see. And the next fight is, of course, Build Back Better. So we're seeing polling as well, Julie, as you know, that shows Republicans with a big lead going into the midterms next year. Something I know you're watching for us. We'll be in touch. Always good to see political reporter for The Hill, Julia Manchester. Thanks. Thank you. President Biden preparing to take on one of his biggest foreign policy challenges when he holds a high stakes virtual meeting with China's President Xi Jinping in just about an hour from right now. As a matter of fact, the two leaders have spoken twice by phone this year, most recently a 90 minute conversation on September 9th. It comes amid strained relations between the two countries, especially over Taiwan. Ahead of the meeting, the top diplomats from both sides exchanged stern warnings over that issue and here to talk more senior fellow at the Gatestone Institute, author of The Coming Collapse of China and the Great U.S.-China Tech War, Gordon Chang. So, Gordon, let's start with the military developments that are concerning a lot of people, not just with Taiwan, but with China using these mock-ups of our aircraft carriers for training, and they even put them on railroad lines to hit moving targets. How do they address this and go at this on a Zoom call? I don't think that they really can, because China's hostility to the U.S. is inherent in that system. And for various reasons, they view the United States as an existential threat, especially because they understand our inspirational impact on the Chinese people, and they are very insecure about their grip on power. That's the nature of totalitarian leaders. So, you know, Biden, um, Tony Blinken, Jake Sullivan, they can say all they want, but they're not going to change the inherent nature of China's Communist Party. It would take, Gordon, a, a while to list off all the concerns right now between, you know, trade, space, COVID, hypersonic missiles. Uh, Jen Psaki called it intensive diplomacy. What do you think is issue number one on this call tonight? Well, I think that issue number one should be the origins of COVID and what China did to spread it to the American people, because that's 763,000 Americans that have been killed. Mm. But we know that Biden doesn't really care very much about COVID. He had his two hour phone call with Xi Jinping in February and by Biden's own admission, he didn't raise the issue even once. Mm. What will be the number one issue? Uh, it could very well be climate change because they can agree on that. It could be Taiwan, whatever it is, though, I think that we have to understand the malicious nature of what China did. And we have to have some penalty on China because we don't want China to think they can spread the next disease to us. All right, we'll see how it goes. The call again coming up about an hour from right now. Gordon Chang, good to see you again. Thanks. Thank you, Joe. Imagine you own a business and it's being ransacked. You call the police. They say we can't come because of staff shortages. We'll talk with that business owner next. And more gang members arrested at the southern border over the weekend. I'll speak with a man next. Recently down there, News Nation's own Leland Vitter. We continue. Nine one one. What's your emergency? Shoplifting, burglary, vandalism? Not an emergency. That's essentially what convenience store owner Lynn Tu faced last month. Tu called police in Austin, Texas, after his store had been ransacked and attacked multiple times. When he called nine one one, he was instead told to call another non-emergency number three one one to file a complaint. This comes amid police budget cuts and a policy change in which cops can now only respond to life-threatening calls. Two called it a nightmare. He joins us now live. So, Mr. Two, sorry to hear this, this all happened to you, but walk us through what happened when you called. What was happening, and was it, in fact, something that was going on at the time when you called? Uh, the worst experience I've had of all recently is when I'm getting shoplifted. I go outside. 
I try to call 911 and, hey, the guy's trying to attack me because I'm trying to stop them from stealing stuff. And they like, oh, have you been hit? I was like, no, but he's threatening me. He's fixing to hit me. And they're like, well, we can't do anything. You need to call 311. So is this part of why you decided to support this, this measure that was just voted on in Austin that would have put more police on the streets? Yeah, I, I'm, I mean, I'm very disturbed. There's, there's no solution right now with the city council voted to make 911 calls only priority if you're hurt or injured. And everything else is called 311 and file report, and that's too late most of the time. Just like when I have a burglary, I call 911. Mm -hmm. They're like, are they gone? Are they done? They don't send detectives to do right. investigation right away. They just want you to file a report, and then that's it. So why do you think this failed, Lynn? I mean, from what I could read anyway in the local paper there, it was because the other side said this would come at the expense of uh, firefighters, medics, and other personnel. Is that why you think in the end it didn't pass? I'm still in shock. I cannot believe it's that big of a difference in the vote. I mean, we need safety first, and then everything else should fall in line. I mean, this is city of Austin. It's not a priority for the city council if you're getting a potential to get attacked for it to escalate worse. I mean, another example is right now, criminals know cops don't respond within a minute or two. I was recently burglarized, and they're in the store for five minutes, hmm. taking their time, grabbing whatever they wanted. Usually they run in and grab everything and in and out in 40 seconds. They, they want to get away before the cops come. Now they don't think the cops will ever come. Are you thinking about closing your business as a result? I have no idea. I mean, I'm at the very end of it right now. Either Austin's got to change or there's no reason to have a business if the criminal is the only one that are benefiting from everything. Well, it's changing, that's for sure. All we hear about is how many people are moving to your city there, and it's beautiful for sure, but it needs to be safe. We'll see what happens. I know the council has called to hire another 300 officers. We'll see if that moves forward. Lynn, too, uh, it's great to have you. Good luck to you there in Austin, Texas. Thanks for sharing your story. All right. Thank you. On Balance with Cleveland Bitter starts at the top of the hour. He joins us on set now. What do you have tonight? Well, working on a story that I know you've uh, done a lot on, which is what's happening down on the southern border. It hasn't been talked about a lot lately, but we're seeing this sort of two-story approach to the southern border because you've got the border patrol that is now overwhelmed. They become the border processing group that right. takes care of all these migrants. And it's actually the Texas Department of Public Safety. It's the state police now who are trying to go in and round up the people who get away, who gets away, the people who run, who runs. Oftentimes it's the gang members, the drug smugglers, the people with felony convictions, like some of the ones in this group. This was on a ranch outside of Del Rio, Texas over the weekend. We got uh, obtained this video. We're gonna talk to some of the people who were involved uh, in the manhunt and also talk to them about some of the people who got away uh, during it. So DPS, the, the Department of Public Safety, is is trying a new tact with this because of the, I guess, where the yeah. federal laws. Right. Well, so the Border Patrol the now is is just processing all of these migrants, and the bad guys know this, right? So what the cartels will do is they'll send a big group towards the Border Patrol, so the Border Patrol gets overwhelmed, and then over here they'll smuggle through drugs or gang members or people with bad histories or some of their own. Uh, enforcers, gunmen, leaders, et cetera. What Texas Department of Public Safety did is they figured out, well, a lot of times the bad guys are walking through private land. They got permission from the landowners to go on and set up raid squads and, and grab the people who the cartels don't want to have caught, right. catch them on private land. They can be charged with trespass. So rather than being turned over to Border Patrol as just migrants, they're turned over with a criminal charge. Therefore, they get deported. And they're filling up local jails. It's, it's unbelievable. It's stunning. Even though most of them are, only 3% of them, I think, are convicted on, on the trespass. So right? far, only 3% have been convicted. The important thing is, is that once they have a criminal arrest, they're treated differently by Border Patrol. Mm -hmm. And what te the Texas guys say, look, if the Border Patrol was doing its job and there wasn't these talking points by the cartels that come to America because of President, Obama, uh, President Biden's campaign promises, we wouldn't have to do this and we could go back to doing our job as state cops. Unfortunately, that's not the case. What are you hearing about the caravan? What's the latest on that? I know you've been tracking. You have a reporter who's uh, yeah. We, we've talked to Ali Bradley, who's been with him. There's a couple of different caravans uh, heading north. 
Uh, difficult times for all of them. The issue is going to be where in the U.S. do they decide to right. come? Do they decide to come uh, down in the Rio Grande Valley? Do they decide to come to Del Rio, which is where all the Haitians were under the bridge? Or Arizona. Or right. Arizona. Because remember, depending on where you are, you're treated differently. Hmm. Because of how over, just because of the way the numbers work. All right, Leland Vitter, more on the t on on balance, which comes up at the top of the hour right here. Leland, thanks. We'll see, see you then. Yep. Just how many birthday cards did a World War II veteran receive? A lot. You can guess. We'll have the answer for you coming up. Look at that. On Friday, the Fifth U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals in New Orleans upheld its decision to pause the president's vaccine mandate for private businesses with more than 100 employees. In fact, we broke the news right here on this broadcast. This rule to uphold the temporary stay on President Biden's vaccine mandate on businesses. The businesses suing to stop that mandate are claiming it causes, as they put it, irreparable harm. The lawsuit says that businesses would lose employees, incur unrecoverable compliance costs, and face deteriorating questions in already fragile supply chains and labor markets. Certainly good news. We were able to break about an hour before anyone else. Now we've learned White House Chief of Staff Ron Klain may have played a role in that decision by retweeting a post from MSNBC's Stephanie Rule, who noted that the OSHA business mandate was, quote, the ultimate workaround for the government to impose a vaccine mandate. That retweet was actually included in the circuit court judge's ruling to hold the stay. Again, essentially at this point, blocking the mandate, at least for now. Maybe that explains why so many people put retweets don't equal endorsements on their Twitter feeds. Here's some good news for journalists, and boy, don't we need it. Pope Francis had some comforting words for all journalists this weekend, calling the career a mission, not a profession. At a ceremony today honoring two journalists, the Holy Father said, the mission of journalists is to, quote, explain the world, to make it less obscure, to make those who live in it less afraid of it, and look at others with greater awareness and also with more confidence. Certainly not an easy mission. It is complicated to think, to meditate, to study more deeply, to stop and collect ideas, and to study the context and precedence of a piece of news. That was just part of the statement from the Pope today. A lot of journalists talking about those words today. It isn't easy, and you could certainly argue that it isn't getting any easier as well. But the truth is we do our best every day. Time for tonight's American Snapshot. We are still showing love to veterans, even though it ended last Thursday. Never really ends, does it? World War II veteran Claudio Cantu celebrated her birthday on October 30th and has the birthday cards to prove it. In fact, she's still opening them. All 787 of them. Cantu joined the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps in 1942. She was just 21 because both of her brothers were fighting in the war. She wanted to help out do her part as well. So when word got out about her birthday, her war experiences were even turned into a lesson plan for a few lucky seventh graders. So tend to that garden. Great to see that. Beautiful pictures. In fact, both of them count tonight. As our American Snapshot, happy belated birthday to Claudia. Appreciate it. Thank you for your time tonight. I'm Joe Donlin. Have a great night on Balance next. Thank you for watching. Click the red subscribe button below so you can get more of News Nation's fact-driven, unbiased coverage.